Hi, I'm Jessica. Um, my Twitter handle is ITGirl. Um, if you really want, you can scan this QR code, but then we'll both feel really lame, so whatever. Um, I'm just going to do a really, I did a presentation on Distro Astro at uh, LinuxConf, just gone. I organised a mini conference over there on astronomy. Uh, it seems, for some unknown reason, that the intersection of space nerds and IT nerds and geeks of all sorts is quite a bit of overlap, so there seems to be a lot of interest in this. Distro Astro is basically a Linux distribution focused on providing tools for amateur and professional astronomers in one easy to use and install package. Um, so it makes it very simple for people to get into using uh, Linux tools for, um, for astronomy. Anyone who's not sure what Linux is, it's basically an open source operating system, which means that it is free, as in no cost, but also open, meaning people can modify it, extend it, and um, change it as they like. So. Uh, a little bit of stuff here, uh, a lot of technical detail. I'm basically going to skim through a lot of this stuff. There's been a couple of, um, of different releases of it. We're now on Distro Astro version 2. Uh, this is the sort of stuff that it includes, a whole bunch of different utilities, including visualization tools, which are great for education or just for fun, because they're really cool. I'm going to demo, demo, do a very quick demo on one of those um, today. Um, also, things like planetariums, so that you can actually uh, look at what's available in the sky in your area uh, if you're going out observing. <clears throat> and again, they can be used for education purposes. Uh, some mapping software, software to help you process um, astrophotography images. Um, a lot of people are heavily into uh, astrophoto uh, astrophotography in the amateur astronomy community. Getting to the point now where some of the gear that people have is producing images that 10 or 15 years ago you would have thought only came from a space telescope. It's really just that good with um, amateur, and when I say amateur equipment, these are people who've spent upwards of 80 or $100,000 on their telescopes and their mounts. So it's probably semi-professional in, in that sense. Um, and also things like tele telescope control. You can hook up your telescope to your computer, either directly or over Bluetooth or something like that, and actually use this software to point your telescope to track objects and all those kind of things. Um, so I'll do a little quick demo, just because I think it's really cool just for people to see what's in this kind of software. And it may never have occurred to people before um, to utilize something like this. So this is what it looks like when you go to log in. Um, And I'm going to show you a little uh, solar system tour using software, software called Celestia. Celestia is also open source software, um, and again, which means you can grab it from a website. It also works not just on Linux, but there are also versions that run on Windows and on Mac OS as well. So this is something you can download and install to your own computer, regardless of what you're running, even if you don't want to go the whole hog of having a completely Linux-based distribution. So, it's, um, it's kind of a 3D space visualization tool. It's got a lot of stuff. You can actually add a whole lot of textures. You can actually add real world data from various space, space missions as well. Um, a whole bunch of nerds have done all sorts of add-on packs and things like Star Wars add-ons. So you can go and visit Endor and you can blow up the Death Star and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, um, is also very cool. Um, we're not going to do that today, though. So to give you a feel for the sorts of things it can do, I'm just going to run a script which does a tour of the solar system. And it actually has, it supports its own scripting language, so you can actually write these kind of scripts to do things yourself. So this loads a whole bunch of textures. And again, it's actually using actual photographic data from various missions that have gone out to, um, to the planets and their moons and utilizes that. So we go past Sol, <coughs> we head out to Mercury and obviously progressively from there. I won't run the whole tour because it, it goes on for quite a way. We end up visiting the outer planets and then the minor planets and asteroids and all sorts of things like that. Um, is it visible? Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> it incorporates the ability to switch on or off various types of things like labels and orbits and things as well. So <clears throat> for instance, if we pause it there, that's not the menu I need. Uh, so if we are going to then show um, orbits, we then start to see that data overlaid on the visualization. So you can put pause and so forth. You can put all sorts of labels on all sorts of objects. If, for instance, you switch on labels for stars, then the whole thing becomes labels because obviously there's uh, allegedly quite a lot of stars. Um, and so you can choose even to switch on things like orbits for spacecraft so that when you get out to Cassini, and it does vary a little bit between the different versions of, sorry, of Celestia. Um, 
Kepler elements? Pardon? Uh, I don't know actually, off the top of my head. Um, so there's a little bit of variance between the different versions on different uh, platforms. So for instance, on the Windows version of Celestia, I know that they have um, uh, orbital data for Cassini. So when you switch on orbital stuff around Saturn, you see this massive bird's nest of all of the orbits Cassini's done around there. For some reason, that doesn't seem to have come through to the Linux version. So there's a little bit of differences between there. You can see also it actually puts uh, you know, Milky Way background data and stuff as well. Um, and so it's very cool as a visualization tool. It's very cool just to muck around with and play with. Um, and it's also a really, it's a really nice gateway drug for kids uh, and others who may be interested in astronomy, interested in computing, and have may, it's maybe never occurred to them that the two things have some kind of natural, um, I hate using the word synergy, but it does. Um, so anyway, I think that's really cool stuff. I'm just gonna pause that there and head back to the presentation. There's other things like a virtual moon atlas, which actually uses mission data from the various different missions for moon mapping, including things like the, uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance um, Orbiter, also the, uh, the Chinese Chang'e um, uh, reconnaissance missions and so forth. And you can get data that, that is actually um, down to about, currently down to about 60 meters per pixel, which may not sound like a lot, but that's actually really, really, really detailed mapping of, of the moon. Um, so it gives you an astronomy-themed desktop environment, which is a nice thing to have if you're into astronomy. Wallpapers, all that kind of stuff. It actually has a, a night vision mode, which basically switches everything on the screen so that you don't lose your dark adaptation if you've got your laptop out in the field. Um, some astronomers, if you go to star parties and things, uh, are not so fussed about white light. Some are very, very, very fussy about that. And don't you dare turn on anything that's not a, a red light, uh, or you will be roundly chastised for it. Um, because obviously people don't want to, want to lose their dark adaptation. Uh, so at the moment, this is a little project I found not that long ago, maybe six months or so ago, and it's basically being run by two or three people. Uh, there's a guy in the Philippines, um, Bam Gabriana, who is basically doing all of the, the distro building um, and maintains the repository. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do out of the mini conference for LCA was um, uh, to kind of build a little bit of community around this project because I think there's an opportunity for uh, Linux people and IT people to get behind something like this. Uh, and actually we're starting to move towards that now. Um, Arnet have, um, have, have nicely offered to host the repository for us and the ISO. An ISO is basically just uh, an image file that you can burn to a DVD and you can use it to install or as I've done, use it to install into a virtual machine. Uh, there's a guy called Nick Howe who is an astronomer in the UK. He's actually creating virtual machines based off Distro Astro, or there's kind of a, 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 a convergent evolution of those two projects so that um, people can actually literally just go and download a virtual machine, spin it up without having to do any installation uh, on whatever they happen to be running. Um, and um, a guy called Richie Jarvis is also doing it as well. So it's a very, very small team and there's no kind of obviously professional um, component in this is just people doing stuff on their own time because they think it's cool and I'm sure we can none of us relate to that at all. Um, so at the moment there's only a 32-bit ISO mainly that's because they, they don't currently have hardware that they can build the distribution on um, and we're starting to solve that problem. A couple of people have put up offers of being able to either do the builds themselves on their equipment. We did have an offer of donation of some equipment. Um, physically shipping things around the planet is a little bit difficult um, on a shoestring budget but we're also potentially going to be able to get some cloud hosted 64 bit machines that people can build against. Um, and these are the resource limits, as in any project, obviously, um, as, sorry, is uh, people, hardware, and bandwidth. Um, the bandwidth problem is just about solved with the Rnet mirroring side of things because they have, for all intents and purposes, unlimited bandwidth and unlimited storage, so that's nice. Um, more people is good. Many hands make light work, as they say. Um, oh, as I said, there we go. Um, and these are the things we need. So that most of those have actually been done. The torrents is also another way, obviously, that people can get this ISO. Um, the problem is, is that not many people are seeding it at the moment. So even if you're not all that interested, but you want to have a bit of a play, if you grab the, the torrent, I'd encourage you to keep seeding it for a while because more seeders makes it much easier for other people to grab it in a reasonable time frame. They also need things like beta testers, people who want to do development work, people who want to do packaging, uh, all of that kind of stuff, people who can do documentation and marketing, anything like a, a typical open source project needs, all of these kinds of people, um, and people to promote it. And hopefully that can be part of what we all can do in this, um, in this context. Um, 
if you want to get involved, talk to me, um, come up and see me, uh, tweet at me, my tea girl. Um, I've got some cards over here. I've actually got two cards. One is mine. Um, grab that if you need to contact me. Uh, in a, with another hat, I actually run the ACT chapter of SAGEU, which is the System Administrators Guild of, of Australia. So if you're in the sysadmin vaguely related kind of area, you might want to talk to me about that as well. That's a whole other thing. Um, grab the distro, play with it, spin it up on a VM, install it on a machine. Um, away you go, tweet about it. FaceTube it, um, Google Plus it, all these kinds of things. Um, the ISO is 2.1 gig, which is really not all that big. Um, it will grow over time because they're actually looking at putting more packages in that are specific to astronomy related stuff over the next few months. Here's how you can get it. Um, and these are the people. Now, obviously, I can make this stuff available to you. Ping me and I'll send you all of the info there. Um, it's being recorded, so it'll be streamed and available. So all of that kind of stuff. Um, that's about it. Does anyone have any questions or comments or want to volunteer their time or I'm equipment? Away because you added Open Rocket. And open and Rocket and is and awesomely and cool. Do we ha how are we going for time? We've got a couple of minutes. Open Rocket is this thing for other nerds who do model rocketry up to various kind of scales. And it is an open source piece of software that allows you to design rockets and to determine how they're going to look, uh, what their performance characteristics are going to be. And this is just very, very basic kind of stuff. And so you can decide what kind of motors you're going to put into them, all that kind of stuff. You can design them, design what kind of profile uh, the nose cone's going to have, how long it's going to be. And you can basically model all of this stuff virtually before you actually have to go out and destroy things by having rockets that go in all sorts of weird wrong directions. So yeah, there's, there's also some, some really cool stuff there, as well as all the sort of stuff that the, um, the professional astronomers actually use. Um, no, I don't want to do that. Um, so the things that the... Uh, professional astronomers are going to use as well in terms of analysing data sets and all that kind of stuff, or professional imagery, um, are all built into this as well. Um, there seems to be uh, a heap of, of software that is being used by professional astronomers, open source software. Uh, that seems to be a well kind of serviced market. Um, a lot of the software that is on the amateur side of things tends to be the Windows stuff. And my theory about this, it's only a, a completely unsubstantiated pet theory, but it has the ring of truthiness to it, is that um, amateur astronomy is often a kind of a hobby thing that people get more chance to do once they've retired. The people writing software have often come from the commercial world, so they'll write what they know, what they know, whether it's going to be .NET or any other kind of thing. And so they actually, um, quite understandably, do that without um, creating a new learning curve. What it can lead to, though, sometimes is this odd situation where people have contacted the people who write this software and say, hey, because they're open source people, they say, hey, I'd like to contribute to this. How can I do that? And they kind of go, no, go away. It's mine. Why would, you, why would I want to let you mess with my software? And there's that kind of disconnect. And so, you know, it's part of this also is, well, we need to maybe identify some gaps where, if for, the, for the Linux community, where there are solutions for amateur astronomers on the Windows platform, but maybe there's nothing equivalent other than running it under Wine or something like that. Uh, one example is Registax. Um, this isn't a purist distribution. It does incorporate software that, ha that runs under Wine uh, and those sorts of things, but there may be opportunities for people to actually develop equivalent functionality that can be entirely open source and Linux native. So. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Yes. Um, mostly telescope control, I think, is, is what's built in from the hardware control side of things. Um, I'm not really aware. I haven't, do, I haven't done any digging into hardware control. But it, for the most part, I think it's just telescopes is what people want to control. And mostly optical telescopes uh, as well, obviously, for the amateur community. I think there are some applications that look at um, amateur radio astronomy, but it tends to be a much, um, a much less easy kind of hobby to get into than yeah, the optical side. Yeah, exactly. There exactly. Was a, Cam Barron was featured on the news a couple of nights ago. He's got the dirty, great, big green... Um, Dave on the front yard. Oh, right, yeah. Um, I can't think who it was, but I... There's, uh, there's, there's what, it's green, so, and I think it might be the one down at Warrington. A lot of people are basically... Is in the backyard of a house in the back of Duffy. 
there are kind of purpose-built, um, you know, geodesic dome type things for, for telescopes, but a lot of people basically use um, things like garden sheds and then modify the roof to flip off or roll off usually, something like that. Um, and if they've got somewhere that's a moderately dark site, Canberra's not too bad for a, a major population centre. Um, and also, there's a lot of really good dark sky sites within very easy drive of Canberra. Um, the Canberra Astronomical Society, if you are interested in uh, astronomy and space and all such things, um, the uh, Canberra Astronomical Society meets every month, um, actually on Mount Stromlo. Um, so uh, that's something to come along with as well. And I'm done. Over to, over to Brenda.